Hello again. I had meant to get back to this video a long time ago and we're already back into the winter time. So it's taken me a little while to get here but I just uh, had some sunny days here so I thought I'll do this because the lighting is good and I have got to a few projects lately and I want to show uh, where I've got up to with them. So uh, a little bit later on in the video I'm going to be warping up my peg loom again and I also want to um, show a little bit about a project that I've been working on uh, which is slightly different for me. Um, but first of all I thought we could revisit this Gansey knitting project. It's quite the project and if you like lots of knitting this is for you <laughs> it takes hours and that's fine comes out of this book by Beth Brown Rensel and I'm doing the Eriske Gansey as I was using this book the first time the first project that I've done out of it I opened it up here a couple of times and all the pages sprung out so, mm, bottom marks for interweave press on the binding for that. I was very disappointed in that because it's not a cheap book. $29.99 in America. I think I paid £19 for it in the UK. Um, but anyway, the actual contents of the book are very, very good. Not quite sure what I'm going to do about the binding. <laughs> so I have now got up to... Let me just take some of my... This, this looks terrible, actually, because I don't use stitch holders. I tend to use double-pointed needles to just hold my stitches on, so they're all hanging off it. It's like an, some kind of alien. But anyway, I've got the... Uh, the what I would call the flaps done, which is coming up on the double-pointed needles in the round up to the underarm hole here and then the gusset under the arm is knitted in as you can see there I hope it's knitted in there and then I like the way this is constructed it's just made so much for ease of wear the shoulder saddle it's called a saddle can you see that there it starts here you actually cast on I think it's 34 stitches here and slightly decrease them and pick up one from this saddle sorry one from this flap and one from this flap as you go so the saddle actually joins the two sides of the sweater together and I just think that's fabulous that's never ever going to come undone because it's all one piece there's no seam and then inserting the double pointed needles into the side flap and picking up the um, underarm gusset there and reducing the size of the gusset as you go along with the needle with the needle with the um, with the arm okay so yeah I still have a long way to go on this even though I have the whole of the body done now front and back and I'm very happy that I have but it's taken me an awful long time to get there but it's very satisfying and beautiful and I've seen a few of these online that have been knitted by hand just like I'm doing and they are fabulously expensive I think I saw 900 pounds so <laughs> I think that's a fair price actually because there's so much knitting but yeah anyway I decided on a whim to have a go at doing something slightly different so I had this spring a beautiful um, blue taxel fleece and I've just brought it in here to show the colors in this are fabulous um, there are some bleach tips and I've got everything from a dark grey, dark charcoal grey, through brown, through light brown, light grey here. And the, the reason that I've chosen this fleece for this project 
is because of the fineness of the wool. Now I had three shearling fleeces from the same um, breeder, but this particular one was definitely more fine than the other two. So this one I felt would felt. <laughs> it's, it's fine enough to felt. It's as fine as a soft Shetland, this one. So it's really a matter of just, you know, feeling the wool and just seeing with this really felt. Now, I don't normally do much felting, so I'm not an expert at it, but I just thought I would have a go. So I spun this up like I spun the Shetland in the last video, where I literally just took a piece of raw fleece to the spinning wheel and spun it as I went. I did not pre-card this at all. And this is the yarn that I got from that. It is spun to 80 uh, yards to 100 grams approximately. And that's a chunky yarn. It might be slightly more like 90 yards to 100 grams. So maybe if I just wind that around this book here, that might help to see it. I don't know if that does actually, but um, it's a two ply and it's got a lot of body to it, but it's also fairly soft. Now, mm, I might even wear that in a scarf. It, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I actually spun it up from my shop, but I just thought, I looked at it and I thought, I just really like that yarn. So I'd like to do a project with it for myself. So um, that's what I did. I downloaded a pattern off of Ravelry. I hope you can see that a little bit more there. I downloaded a pattern from Ravelry that was free and I've been looking for it. I've mislaid it, but it's, Chunky, if you just put in chunky wool uh, mittens, free pattern, there were a few of them. So uh, I will try and find that and put the link in and give the um, person who uh, has designed that the credit for, for this. So I actually uh, knitted them up on seven millimeter needles, which was larger than what they called for particularly like these Knit Pro needles. They're very heavy and slippery for this kind of project, but they worked. So I knitted these gloves up twice as big as the pattern called for. I knitted the largest size. I needed longer um, mitten pieces, so they're very loose and floppy to put on. And then I threw them into the washing machine twice. Uh, it really was quite nerve wracking to do that because I was afraid I would ruin them. But after putting them into a 40 degree wash with just some plain soap, um, and they came out almost small enough for me, but not quite. And then I just thought, right, I'm going to go for this and put them in the second time. And I really like the way they've come out. I have knitted... Um, I have um, actually embroidered some little designs on there with some other hand spun wool that I have. They're really, really for the cold weather. And I have lined these with some fleece fabric that I had just lying about in the cupboard. And I cut the pieces out using the gloves as a template made it slightly bigger, seamed it, and then I basically made gloves inside out and sewed them in to the edge here, not into the ribbing. And the reason for that was that I wanted to do an extra ribbing within these gloves. So I picked up a knit around here. I think there are 50, 56 stitches, I think I did a two by two rib and I did that on a smaller needle with a, excuse me, thinner yarn. 
um, that I hand spun out of some Shetland. Now that would be spun to around 120 yards to 100 grams, that one. It's uh, less chunky. But I wanted it to just sort of disappear, so I wanted the same colour there. So the gloves could be worn like that. That inner cuff is really to stop the snow going up, but I prefer them like that. So there's not a lot going to get through those because they are felted so much. They are really impervious to the wind. And I think if you were making snowballs, you'd have pretty dry hands. I like the fact that all of the little colors are showing there from the fleece. So that's a pair of absolutely super extra warm gloves for really, really cold weather. I think they'd be good on a mountain bike. So anyway, my next project is going to be this peg loom and I'm going to set it up here on the table and show how I warp it up. And then I will probably move it through to my work table. I've decided to warp up my peg loom again and I'm using flax twine here which is what I would normally use on a carpet or rug uh, for, a, for a loom as a warp. It's a very smooth linen thread which is quite heavy and I was trying to work out exactly how to do this and I've decided to use my rigid heddle warping peg here and I have made little string heddles to go through each one of the pegs and I'll just show one of those there I just put a string heddle through each peg and I'm looping each one of these warp threads through that loop the reason for that is that this warp is very slightly thicker than the holes in my pegs. So I'm basically just tying that on there. And I'm taking it up to my warping peg, looping it round the peg, and then cutting it a little bit longer. Then each one can go through the string heddle. It's a little bit laborious, but it means I get all of these strings in exactly the right length. And then I'm just tying them on there. So I'm going to continue on and I'll move this peg down the table as I go and then I'll show you how I go on to the next stage. So I'm working my way along, I'm about a third of the way in and I'm just showing this up close that the um, string heddle is through my peg and my warp is through my string heddle. So you can see I have all of these threads now through the heddles, the string heddles, all the way to the end. And that took me about 50 minutes, so just under an hour. So that wasn't too bad. I'll show you the other end here. We want these um, warp threads all to be the same length at the end so that when I put the fleece yarn in, to the peg loom that it, when I push it all the way down to the bottom here that it's actually stopping um, at some point and I, I'm going to use the same hack for this loom as I used on the cushion cover um, by putting a rod into the end so I want my rod uh, just here to be at the same length I want all of these at the same tension so I have put in a slip knot here hopefully you can see that and I've just pulled that gently down to where all of those um, loops are that came off of here. I just lifted them off. 
and then I have put that slip knot in. Now I'm not really tightening that hard down yet. I'm going to wait till I've got all of them done. I've got another one over here and another one over here. I'm working my way along um, putting all of these warps together and then I'm going to try and get all of these in the same position. So I'm just now putting these groups of um, warp threads over this piece of dowel which I used for my cushion cover project and again I have the piece of wood down on the table which I'm going to clamp and then I have some screws in it which I showed before and that just holds that somewhat taut and then I'm going to work at readjusting these slip knots so that they're all you know just about the same length and then I'm going to lift this whole project from this table and take it through to another work table that I have. I have moved this project out now to a work table which I keep out in my sun lounge and the thing I discovered straight away which I had thought would be the case was that the warping threads on this peg loom are now too long for this table so as I want to tension them with a sort of makeshift warping um, beam here this piece of dowel I decided to just put some extensions onto it so you can see how I've just I just fired these on out in the garage they're just old bits of fence plank and I put two screws in there so that's made this to be the right length for the rug I would also say about this is just get a tape measure out and measure from your peg loom to the back here just to make sure um, that it's absolutely at a right angle because if it isn't then your finished rug is going to not be entirely square so yeah I just adjusted the clamps to make sure that that was the case I, I have 70 inches of warp here and that is far too long for the rug that I want but I like to have extra and I'm going to put some packing in at this end before I start my wool weaving because I want to be able to remove the packing afterwards and then just um, have a fringe that I can finish off so I'm just going to work my way down here and get these all nice and even. It doesn't have to take very long, it just needs to be somewhat um, even. So I'm just um, weaving in some rag filler here onto the beginning of the warp. This will get advanced right down to the, to the bottom. Um, so that it creates a nice buffer against which to weave my woolen yarns that I have spun on the Ashford Country Spinner. I prefer to spin very bulky yarns and weave them onto the peg loom. Some people prefer to make these rugs out of raw fleece that they weave and they twist as they weave it and that's fine and um, I think that works well with certain fleeces that might already be partially felted and in fact I do have a Hebridean fleece out in my workshop that is too felted to spin and I may make a rug from it in that way and I would use the wider spacing then but for um, the yarns that I have this is a good spacing and I think that's just something you know trial and error that you would learn as you go so so I've been doing a little bit more of the weaving here uh, yesterday afternoon and this morning I'm just going to start advancing that warp down sorry advancing the weft down these slightly tensioned warp threads now every time I take those pegs out 
I have to lift this just to release the tension. So I just lift that like that and I lay it there. I will take my pegs out, advance my weft, and then I just hook this back in here. Now, it could be that as the weaving progresses, the tension on these warp threads might get to slightly more, which is, is what's happening here, because, and that's pulling that slightly. And that's because the weft is taking up some of the warp, it's making it do this. So these become a little tighter. So in a little while, I'll probably just bring this in slightly so that there's less tension on it. You wouldn't notice this on a floor loom. You would just ratchet it to wherever you wanted it. But because we're doing a sort of makeshift arrangement with an old curtain pole, <laughs> We just have to do what we do. So um, I'll just do a little bit more of this, this weaving here. And you can see as I'm going, I make quite good speed because the fleece is already turned into a very bulky yarn. Some of the bits are quite bulky, like that piece there I just did. And so, you know, they take a little bit more pushing down, but I'm doing all of the pushing that you would do normally with a reed when you would weave. I'm doing that with my fingers and just packing that down with my fingers. And it's a very satisfying process. I really enjoy doing this. It's quiet and it's simple. And I love the result that I get from this. So I'm going to go about that far, I think, on this gray, because I don't want too much gray in there. And I'm breaking that there. I keep my yarn down by my feet in this basket. So, sorry, the camera's quite a long way off from where I'm working. Hopefully you can hear me all right. So, in order to take these pegs out now, I'm going to have to just lift that, like I said before. I just lay it in there. And then I can work at lifting out these pegs and advancing the weft. And I usually start at one end like this. All my pegs are numbered, like I showed in my last video on the peg loom. And I will put those straight back in, okay, as a sort of marker. And then I'll take more of them out. Now I've got to the bit where I'm joining, so I'm leaving that hanging down here and I'm going to do this in sections. And as I go, I'm just making a quick note of the peg numbers because even with just doing a few like this and, and even having them numbered, I have still, just in this short bit of weaving, managed to cross them a couple of times. So it's very, very easy to do and therefore you do really need these numbers. So that is going round that peg. The piece I finished with is going round that peg. This is probably difficult and I to see. I'm just going to hook that in for when I come back to it. I'll actually get pulled out when I advance the warp. I've just moved the camera so that you can see from this angle. When you take these pegs out, just try and lay them like that. Don't sort of throw them because the more orderly you keep everything, the easier it is to keep it in order. <laughs> uh, now you can see this purple thread 
is just the little heddles and they pull through really easily. You don't want anything for heddles that's going to be difficult to pull through. I have seen people online using wire and maybe that works but I was concerned that it might snag the fibres of the wool. So I've used a linen thread for those. So as you can see, this was where I finished here. So just move the camera slightly so you can see that. That was where I finished and I just brought that round so that I would know where I'm starting again. Now, because I'm going to be advancing the weft this time, that will kind of get lost and be a bit irrelevant. I'm holding this, by the way, just by putting a piece of wood across the table with some clamps on. This itself is not clamped, but because it's up against that, it won't go anywhere. So I'm just going to undo that for the moment and then I'm going to reposition the camera so you can see this being pushed down. Right, so here comes the, the weft down the warp. I'm going to just tighten this up again. I'm popping those there. I'm going to have to take some tension off of these side pieces in a minute because this is getting a little bit tight now. So hopefully you can see that really well there, that I pushed this right down and it's as tight as I can get it I think, well I think it's going to get a little bit tighter but I think the tighter this is packed the better the rug will be, um, it's nice and thick, it's good but you don't want it in any way where you could put your fingers through it. So, for instance, if I can see my warp threads, I'm not very happy about that. I want it to be just packed so that I can't see them. And as you can see, each warp thread is a double because if you remember, we had the peg at one end and we went up to the heddle and back. So that was one warp thread, which is a double piece of uh, linen rug string, if you like. So that's very strong, very, very strong. I think I mentioned that in my last video, that you do want a really strong warp because you are really pushing against this. So don't put a lightweight warp on for this kind of project. Anyway, that's nice and I'm going to just go ahead and weave the rest of it and I think right now I'm just going to take a break from this and show you some uh, yarn that I'm going to be spinning that's going to actually be woven into here. I showed you at the beginning of the video the blue uh, textile that I had for making the felted mittens with and I had three of those fleeces and this is a second one. 
that I'm going to be using in this rug and I actually purchased it um, with this in mind because as you can see there it is really a very interesting and textured and beautiful fleece it's got this lovely gray and there are all grays and browns through here but all of the tips are sun bleached now I always go for shearling wool wherever I possibly can because I think you get a better wool a longer wool um, and if there's going to be some bleaching on the tips you'll get a better lock structure on a shearling fleece than on a U fleece now that's not always true I've had some beautiful fleeces from Shetlands and Zortvalls and different ones that have been just U fleeces but this I just felt was very special so not quite enough softness there to go around my my chin so that's not going into a scarf I think actually I have possibly got two fleeces here or was this just one very big one no it was one very big one <laughs> so I'm going to reposition the camera now I've showed you the fleece a little bit and um, you can see me spinning it now I'm not going to uh, just show you the really exciting bits I'm just going to do it um, as I normally do it so I have just positioned the camera hopefully so that you can see the details here I have this on um, the largest whirl setting at the end and the middle setting for the wheels so that's quite a slow spin and I've got my leader thread with a loop on the end and hopefully this isn't going to break sometimes breaks when I'm beginning no nope, it seems to be going in okay and this as I said before is very rough spinning and I'm trying to just show as many of these locks as possible as I go So this is a pre-washed fleece. I always wash my fleeces when they are purchased so that we don't import any moth eggs. And also I like to be able to go out to my storeroom and just grab a fleece and start working on it and not have to think, oh, it's the middle of winter and I've got to try and wash this in a cold climate. So, yeah. As you can see, there's a few bits and pieces going in here that normally wouldn't go into a yarn that was being spun for knitwear or tapestry or something. But I'm not too worried because this is all going on a floor rug. So, yeah, it, it's, it'll look great. So you don't have to be an expert spinner to do this kind of spinning. Now I'm going to grab another piece that is just at random. I have that chunk there. So you can see that you would get through a whole fleece fairly quickly here. I would think if I sat here for an hour I would have almost that bobbin full at this rate. It's very chunky. It's almost too chunky for this spinning wheel to handle. As you noticed, I was just holding the um, flyer here so that that would go in. And then, of course, advance it along your bobbin as it builds. really don't want this on any kind of fast speed here because it um, could get into a big muddle very quickly. So. Anyway, I will come back 
when I've got more of this spun and show it into the rug that I'm weaving here um, before I finish the video so that you can see what it looks like when it's woven. I don't know, as I said before, whether I'm going to get this actually finished, but um, I'll do my best. So I've been doing more weaving and I've got all of this packed down now um, and I think that's probably long enough. I've been working at this just to really get that as tight as possible and there's no trick to this, you just have to, just, you can see it's, there's still more slack to be taken up. So basically just get that as tight as possible with your hands and there's still more to be done here <laughs> i think i've got it as tight as i can and then i find there's still more so yeah um what i'm going to do next here is to i am starting to cut the warps here and i'm going to move the camera up so you can see what i'm doing and as i cut them I'm going to be pulling them up tighter so that will pack that even more. So I've angled the camera now over the top here so hopefully you can see this. I've just cut the first two warps. I want to keep my little string heddles here. I don't want to cut those off. So I've just cut these as near to the string heddle as I can. And I'm taking two. One that is above the warp, the weft, and one below the weft. So I've woven it like that. So there's no point in me splitting this double warp and tying it because we've got to anchor that weft in. So I need two of them. So I'm just going to go down here like this and to start pushing that. And to start with, I'm just going to put a slip knot in there. I'm going to work my way down, doing one at a time. I can always tighten these up later. So the goal here is to get this down as far as I can. So you can see there already there's a bit of slack in there so I because I haven't finished tying that off I can still give that a bit more of a tug. So hopefully you can see that all right. It's a bit difficult to get the camera in exactly the right position but So hopefully you can see here now where as I'm working down I am just making this into a square shape here and one by one just putting a knot on the top of those. As I go down. And then I'm going to be just working at making sure this is all evenly packed and then I will do exactly the same at the other end and if there's any more slack in the weft here I'm going to be just um, equalizing all of that from the other end so I thought I might just try doing some kind of 
braid on this. I'm not quite sure how that's going to look, but I thought I might give it a whirl. I don't know if that's going to improve things or not. Just have to have a quick look here and see. Yeah, that could look nice, I think. I'll just do one for a trial and see what I think of that. I want to leave it long enough so that if there's any need to undo this and tension things up again, I can. So let me just see what that looks like. If I snip it about there. Yeah, I think that's quite nice. So I'll work my way along the whole end here doing that and trimming that up and I'll show that in a minute. I've now got all of these strings off of the warp um, pole that I had at the bottom here and I'm very gently just parting this filler rag that I wove in at the beginning. Move that up there. Now I'm going to do exactly what I did before and I want it to be very straight across the end we don't want it to be sort of trapezoidal so i'm taking one from above one from below again and just tying those tying them up quite tight and the the weft sort of shrinks back there as i do so i'm going to just pull this out flat I'm sorry that the camera angle is probably stopping you from being able to see everything here, but I'm doing my best with what I have. So now I'm going to work my way along here. It's going to take me a few minutes to do that, so I'm not going to film all of that. So um, we'll come back in a minute. So I just want to show a little bit about this tightening up packing down process that I'm doing. If you can see the rug here has bumps in it. It's very difficult to see on the camera. I, I appreciate but I'm trying to get it flat like it is here. So what I'm doing is I'm going along and I'm pulling these warping threads and as I do if you can see that it's just tightening them up and they're secured at the other end, so they're not going to just pull out, but it's just tightening them. That way we don't have these wavy bits in the rug. We just don't want it to be wavy. It needs to lie completely flat when it's on the floor. I, I, that one was really easy to see. I don't know. <laughs> it's difficult with the camera, but there if i'm pulling that hopefully you can just see that it's just and you don't want to over tighten it because if you do then it is probably going to make a ruckle on either side of it you want them all pretty much the same just takes a few minutes of working at it's one of my ends that i'm going to trim off in a minute See, there's quite a lot there once pulling. Not much more there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I think that's, that's very even and very, very good, very flat. And it, it wants to be like this. It wants to be nice and like a board almost. It's very, it's very rigid now. It's nothing sort of floppy. I couldn't get my fingers through this anywhere. So that's just how I want it. I'm just finishing off the rug now. I have gone along the ends and braided them together. Just maybe, let me see, um, two and a half inches in length. Could be any length that you want. I just think that helps to hold these um, wet warp threads in 
Um, I will show you in just a minute another fringe which I did on a rug about 20 years ago, which will show you what happens. But just for now, we'll do this. So that's, that's that end done and I'll turn it round and do the other end. Um, just to show you a, another rug which I wove 20 years ago underneath my chair here. <laughs> um, I braided these. Now you can see from that how they've worn. I mean this is very old and it's been in my utility room and used almost as a doormat. So it's done pretty well, but as you can see, these braids do actually come adrift and come open. If you really want to stop that from ha ever happening, um, Peter Collingwood, who has written a pretty famous book on rug weaving, every aspect of rug weaving, will tell you to put a little blob of PVA glue into each knot and then to pull it strand by strand tight with a pair of pliers. Um, if the rug is going to be washed, that PVA glue would probably need to be waterproof as well. So I did actually do that on another rug that I have and those have held out well. This one I didn't and um, yeah, it's come adrift all over. I'm going to have to go through and tie those back up so that it can be used for another 20 years. The other thing about finishing this rug off is that you would have seen as I was weaving it that there were some areas like this where I have a piece that's left over. Now that's always going to happen in all weaving. I could just snip those off because when I was weaving I overlapped the weft so that it's anchored in but I really don't like to cut because I think it leaves a sort of sort of jagged edge and this is a very um, organic looking rug so what I do is take a crochet hook and in this case I'm using a nine millimeter crochet hook and I will do with this thread exactly how I would um, deal with knitting and just weave my ends in. So I'm just going to weave that in and out until it's lost completely. So um, I'll just work across the rug and do that. So I've now finished the rug. I've darned in all my ends. Um, there's one there actually that I missed. So I will go and poke that in by hand. It's not difficult to do that, just to finish weaving them off. You can weave one way and then weave another way and it just secures them in. So that, that makes that look, look nice. Um, very, very thick. I measured this about an inch and a half in thickness. So this could easily make a sleeping mat, camping mat. I think if I were making camping mats, I probably would make them narrower just for one person to lay on there because you don't want a lot of bulk to carry around when you're camping. This measures 50 inches by 36 inches and that suits the space that I have but I think you have to be careful with the measurements because when you finished weaving and you start to pack this down really hard, then you end up with it shortening. So just be careful to weave a little bit more than you think you might need so that you allow for that. And if you end up weaving for too, you know, too much, you can always take it out. It's just difficult to change it once you've got it, you know, off and you're tying your ends and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased with this and 
I've brought this through to another room now so that the light is easier um, and hopefully you can see this a bit better. Um, these pegs, as I say, came with the loom and they're perfectly good. They are um, 10 centimeters or four inches. And these are nine millimeter dowels and they came with this Dale's loom. Uh, loom and uh, I have thought for some time it would be great to have some longer pegs. I've seen this done online and I just thought this is sensible to have some longer pegs. So these are 20 centimeters and they are a nine millimeter oak dowel that we got from the hardware shop and a little hole has been drilled in each one and I'm going to put those all in there and I'm going to number them and put my string heddles through. And two things about these is that they allow for a lot more weaving before you have to advance it. And it's at the advancing of the weft that takes the time in this kind of project. The other thing is that you can actually see a lot more of your weaving before you advance it. So you can make sort of perhaps more decisions about colors and changing colors and changing textures. Uh, and you can actually see it in front of you better. So I think that's an upgrade and I'm pleased about that.